All right. So talking about um, moving towards the full reopening of the economy, there's been um, quite some movement in that respect from the events we saw last week. Um, let's talk about this now with Samuel Karanja, the CEO of the SME Alliance, who's with me in studio. Um, Samuel, was good news. I just want your overall reaction, first of all, uh, to the president's speech there. A lot of it, you know, he announced a new stimulus program, 13 mm. interventions, but he also made some specific ones mm. to the SME sector. Mm. What was, what are your initial thoughts and reactions to that speech? I think it was a grand speech. And I think um, one of the things that the president did is to give hope to Kenyans and also to the business, the SME business sector. And I've seen uh, that the president focused mainly on agribusiness mm -hmm. because that's something that is really key. Uh, because of what happened uh, with COVID, we are now have to redefine you know, SMEs and it's not only the importation, getting consolidated cargo from China, but you're also supposed to think on how we can be able to produce uh, you know, and uh, add value to what we are producing. So that aspect of value addition, that aspect of agribusiness is key. You saw that the president uh, put uh, a lot of money in uh, tea, in mm -hmm. sugar, mm. In, in, in rice, uh, in milk production, and even raising the prices. And, and one of the things, one of the key things which I noted is directing uh, the Kenya uh, you know, National Trading Corporation to buy rice from where mm. uh, entirely so that they can be able to feed the KDF and, and the rest. And, and I think that's key to be able to resuscitate and to help small and medium entrepreneurs. And having said that, when he opened the economy, uh, very many SMEs thrive at night. Mm -hmm. Because now, um, as you have rightfully said, you know, the buses travel at night, a lot of activities happen at night. So it's a 24 hour economy and it employs a lot of people. There are people even who sell coffee at night, mm -hmm. tea at night. Mm -hmm. There are people who cook food for the drivers at night. We also have, um, you know, small towns, mm. pilot towns, which have, mm. you know, because of the buses traveling at night, uh, and it's a thriving business. So I think right now SMEs are in a very good state. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things which I think is a concern is how are we going to maintain the curve of the infections so that we don't go back there right. again. Yeah. That is also very key so that we, we, we do not just open up and this permissiveness and we are not able now you know to hold to what the president said and then we could easily get and we could ourselves easily now back, slip now yes, back slip back to where we yes. were before yes um and and it's interesting you mentioned things like value addition we'll be speaking to phyllis wakiaga on the same uh, from the association of of manufacturers in kenya and also we'll be talking about long distance travel in 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 just a moment so i'm hoping we can get uh abu bakar talib on on the line for just uh, in just a few minutes from now um but let's talk about about, you know, an, another key one, which was, um, and he talked about, uh, you know, this, the listing with CRB. Yeah. Um, I spoke to uh, one of the, the CEO of one of the, the, mm -hmm. the three CRB in the country, mm -hmm. and they were talking about how, first of all, this will take time. And a lot of these, they will take time. Even if you take a look at the one regarding school desks, mm -hmm. um, you know, supplementary budgets have to be passed by mm -hmm. parliament. Mm -hmm. um, so when do you see this sort of taking effect for mm -hmm. the MSME sector? Mm -hmm. With respect to credit reference, mm -hmm. um, you know, the National Treasury is supposed to hold a stakeholders meeting, mm -hmm. um, you know, and have people around the able to see mm. you know to fast track this of course he said this would be effective from the first of november so yes. we have mm. know, about a Maybe couple of days to yeah. that um, but what are your thoughts around some mm. of those very specific interventions mm. I, I think for the crb it has been a very big handle to smes uh, based on um, we were from a very difficult business environment starting from 2017 going you know coming to 2020 and um, now covid you know sealed uh, the fate of small medium entrepreneurs and you know crb had its own threshold uh, for example even payment uh, lack of payment as little as even a thousand shillings mm. even airtime some of the people <laughs> were, mm. were thrown into crb and i think when when you are making policy we should make policy based on how can we build this sector because this sector is the backbone of the economy mm. and so when 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 when, the, when he lifted that crb to you know five million uh, if you owe five million and below, and below yeah. That that is the you know that is a cluster 
or the cadre of small medium entrepreneurs. Yeah. And one of the things, if you go to the financial institutions, they, they, they were very keen on knowing what is your CRB rating. Yeah. And, and you couldn't get any financial support mm -hmm. or assistance to that. And it, finances is key. Right now, we are not only cushioning businesses, but you're also resuscitating businesses. Mm -hmm. And many times, you, you are not able to pay that loan, not based on mm -hmm. you lacking capacity. Your business may be even thriving, was thriving, but it was affected by COVID and many other things, many other dynamics. But if a small amount of money has been injected, you can be able now to resuscitate or bounce back into business. And I think that is key so that we do not, uh, we do not have punitive mm. you know, measures towards resuscitating yeah, I, and um, so when we spoke to uh, Kamau Konyiha, who's from uh, Credit Info, he said this might actually have um, a negative effect mm. or one that is um, counter to what the president might have intention. Yes. Because it says, for the fact that there would be no information on these businesses mm. and how they are performing mm. in terms of repayment of their loans, mm. that the banks may continue to mm. shun the small businesses when mm. they come in in the absence of a credit mm. score. Mm. Is this um, something you agree with? And in, in any case, um, mm. you know, how is it when they were listing? Mm. Is this something that SMEs have been able to use to their mm. advantage? Mm. You know, some that say, look, I'm here. Mm. I pay my loans as I should, you know, um, every month or on, mm. on whatever basis I'm supposed to be paying it. Mm. Has, are there records of SMEs that mm. have been able to benefit from a positive credit mm. score? Mm. Yes, yes and no. And, and, and the reason why I'm saying yes is when you look at, um, you may judge an SME based on their performance. And I think every financial institution has a role to do their due diligence. Initially, when there was no CRB, people are doing business. Mm. So how are they doing business? You have a personalized um, uh, way or relationship with a financial institution. Yeah. They could come to your business. They could look at your books of account, even if your books of account were as simple as cash in, cash out. Right. And they also see the flow of cash you know, in terms of the performance on your, of your business. And they judge you based on that. And if they find that you don't have capacity, you know, uh, maybe to manage better, they mm -hmm. take you through a training and they give you mm -hmm. uh, the required money in bits. Mm -hmm. And it was a relationship which was built between the trader and the financial institutions, which I think it should go back to that. Yeah. Because there are people with brilliant ideas. There are people who have started brilliant businesses. SMEs have, you know, they have redefined themselves. They are innovative. They have invention. Yeah. But... Your, your paperwork, when you take it to the bank, the bank wants to see cash flows. Yeah. And they want to see something that has already started. But when you look at um, the, the, the negative side, whether it's going to affect, you know, like the relationship between the banking and, uh, and also has it helped the SMB? It did. It did, for the, it did, number one, for the banking sector. Banking sector is in micro, microfinances because yeah. they're also businesses belonging to SMBs because right. they are shareholders to that. Yes. <laughs> so you find that... Um, Yes, it gives a history. It's easier for you to get a centralized data uh -huh. of Karanja yeah. and know what is, the, what is Karanja's mannerism mm -hmm. in terms of payment. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we may misjudge Karanja based on his capacity of not being able to pay okay. Okay. because of different dynamics and he can be able to pay if he's given that assistance. Okay, and we will talk about what that assistance will look like in yes. just a moment. Um, but you had mentioned something about, um, you know, the MSME sector obviously heavily dependent on bus, night bus travel, yes. and that we have the resumption of that, that that might mm. be uh, some good news for the sector, not just for the uh, those who mm. are trading, you know, along the mm. route, but also for the long distance uh, operators mm. themselves. So let's mm. speak to them um, and understand just what this means for them, uh, you know, the transport ministry, the very next day after the president announced the lifting of the curfew then uh, talked about the resumption of night bus travel which had not happened since March of 2020. Let's now speak to Abu Bakr Talib. He's the chair for long distance bus operators. Abu Bakr joining me on phone. Good afternoon and thanks for making time for us on business now. So um, just a quick one. How many of your members do you have um, and speak to us about the effect of well over 18 months of no long distance uh, travel, particularly um, overnight. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, thank you for bringing me on board. Uh, most of our members are gradually uh, starting to operate uh, long distance. Uh, it's not that they're not operating, but uh, because of the night travel, I think it's a relief to most operators and uh, uh, it will help us. Uh, uh, put back our businesses in the right direction. Okay, Abubakar, uh, you know, as the chair for long-distance bus operators, could you tell us 
How many of your members were affected by the ban on overnight travel? The overnight generally was for, for all bus operators. Yeah. Mostly, even the local, local operators are all affected because you could not operate at night. And in what ways were they affected? I mean, talk to us about, you know, buses were being grounded, you know, did members have loans uh, that they're taken on, uh, on their businesses? Just speak to us about the effect that the ban on uh, night travel has had on the members. Yeah, a lot of banks have moved in to repossess uh, most of the buses. As uh, you see, it was taking us, uh, with the night travel, it was, it was affecting us because uh, the SGR was operating at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's, been, it's been a tough period, a tough 18 months. So we hope uh, with this opening by the president that uh, it, will, uh, it will put us back into business. Okay, and so how many of your members now, I mean, you know, is it something that you've uh, began or resumed operations immediately, or do you need some time uh, to sort of get yourselves organized, and what, what exactly would you need to put together to, um, to resume full operations both night and day? We are gradually, uh, we are gradually coming back into night operation. As uh, for the business is still low, there is no money in the economy. So it's it's gradually picking up. You can't say you are putting back all the all the operators are going back to to night to to, to resume operation. It will take a bit of time. And when do you think it'll resume fully? Especially um, with the fact that um, perhaps we're going into the festive season. Maybe um, you know a little bit more money in the economy. And now with the full um, or moving towards full reopening, do you see perhaps um, good tidings in how long by Christmas? Or what's your projection? We are wishing for that. We hope that, uh, that our projections uh, are that uh, during the se December season, yeah. starting up from November 15th onwards, okay. we hope uh, to, to, to have a booming business. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you for that, Abu Bakr Talib. And I know you. you're on the road as we speak and have just taken yeah. a break to speak to us here on Business Now as the chair of uh, Long Distance Bus Operators. Abu Bakr Talib, thank you for your time. Uh, projecting that hopefully from uh, mid-November, uh, heading straight into the festive season, that uh, things will get better. But obviously saying that uh, Long Distance Bus Operators didn't just start, you know, the next day. It wasn't immediate. Uh, a lot of things need to be done. They're saying buses were repossessed by banks and other lending institutions. So um, just um, hoping that perhaps uh, 2021 will be uh, a better year than 2022. So um, we've talked about, you know, the SME sector, and we'll come back and talk a little bit more about, you know, what happens going forward. Uh, but our Samuel Karanja was telling us about uh, value addition being key, and that spoke to some of the interventions that President Uhuru Kenyatta announced in his Mashuja Day speech. Let's now um, hear from Phyllis Wakiaga, who's the CEO of the Kenya Association of manufacturers. Phyllis, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, your initial reaction to those 13 interventions and of course the lifting of the curfew last week Thursday? Um, thanks. Thanks Yvonne for that. I think for the economy and all of us it's a welcome move. Um, the last almost two years have been quite slow for the economy and the lifting of the curfew I think is something that's going to stimulate the growth of the local economy. As Kenya, I think we are envisioned to be a 24-hour economy, and uh, having this reopening uh, happening gradually is going to go a long way in supporting the economic recovery within the country. For the manufacturing sector, it, it therefore points to more consumption uh, locally, because if people are able to continue with their jobs and have their livelihoods uh, through the work that they do, there will be better purchasing power. There will also be increase in consumption of uh, certain uh, manufactured products uh, because of that. If you look at some of the industries that were affected, like the hospitality industry, including the bars and the restaurants, the transport industry, all these are people who uptake locally uh, manufactured products, either at household level or through their businesses. So I think this is a welcome move uh, to reopen the economy and really just re-energize uh, the growth of the economy during this season. 
Uh, all right, let's speak about some of um, those uh, key interventions. Of course, there's been uh, quite a bit in, in the agriculture sector, I believe, in tea, milk, rice. Um, also speaking about the health sector, um, speaking about maybe something that is uh, closer to manufacturing with, you know, the, the making of desks for, for, for students. Of course, that also needs, um, you know, whatever is needed in Parliament to the supplementary budget. Uh, but what were your thoughts around um, some of the targeted uh, in investment announcements? or, you know, targeted specific areas of intervention. I will come to access to capital and finance in a moment, uh, but just wanted to get uh, your thoughts around uh, that specifically. Um, thank, thanks for that. I think we saw that a lot of the measures were around the agricultural sector, and that's, of course, because they are the biggest contributor to the GDP of the country, but it's also for us linked to value addition. If you look at the one billion given to tea farmers on the fertilizer subsidy, those are 1.5 billion to the sugar sector and a number of our members who are millers are able to then get money for their maintenance and also payment to the farmers who have supplied them. We also have the coffee sector reforms which I think will go a long way in really reviving the coffee sector and hopefully lead to more value addition uh, within that sector and also the issue of reduction of the cost of uh, inputs for animal feeds and, 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 and others. So I think all of these moves are welcome because they will continue to inject the much needed stimulus into the agricultural sector and eventually into the value addition of some of these products. We also saw some announcements around the health sector, mm -hmm. the issue of the building of the 50 new facilities, uh, which I think health is critical for all of us. If we have healthy uh, people working in the economy, it's good for the economy. So that, that's a welcome move. There's also the announcement around the vaccination plant, the Biovax plant, I think, um, which really is about local manufacture of vaccines, something that I think is also uh, positive for, for, for the economy. The other announcement was around the production costs, uh, the issue of the stabilization price, um, the stabilization fund for the fuel prices, uh, which is important uh, so that we don't have uh, the rise we saw recently in the fuel prices. If we're able to have that stabilization fund in place and managed properly, it would mean that we have better stability in terms of planning on production costs. Even there's also the issue of uh, uh, the president mentioning that the task force report by the PPA team would be fully implemented so that we see the cost of power come down by the 33%. For us as a manufacturing sector, that's a very welcome move. I think we have been at the forefront of speaking about the need to bring down the cost of production where power costs is one of these important costs. So that is really a move that we applaud because it will lead to uh, Kenya being seen as a strategic investment hub, especially for people who consume uh, a lot of power in their production processes. Yes, and I was, I was going to ask specifically about the cost of, of uh, electricity because that's a big factor, uh, you know, in terms of the cost of production, um, you know, a big one. So not just the cost, but also, um, you know, the stability and, and, you know, the consistent supply of the same. Um, you know, that's an important factor as well. Yes, Yvonne, all those are important factors. Uh, price being very important in certain sectors. If you look at uh, people who are high consumers of uh, power, like the cement sector, the metal and allied sector, especially the steel uh, production side of it, the textile mills, um, and others, this is really a big component. And even for those who are small uh, consumers, it's still a factor of production, because I don't think you can do any manufacturing mm. Uh, without power. Yeah. So that is important for us. We're also keen, of course, about the quality and uh, the reliability of power and the issue of looking even at the transmission losses uh, by the Kenya power that lead to some of these costs of power is mm -hmm. part of that task force report. So I think if the recommendations are holistically implemented, it will lead to a better uh, power sector with better quality, better reliability, and also a reduced cost of power. And that eventually can bring down the cost of production and also uh, bring in more investors into the country. Um, could we speak about um, you know, access to capital and financing for the same? Uh, the president in his speech uh, specifically targeted the MSME with some additional measures, talking about a moratorium on listing at the CRB for um, those businesses that... Um, have a loan you know portfolio of uh, five million or less um but also speaking about um you know 
um, suspending listing for the next one year. Of course, that should take effect. All of these should take effect by November, but it's pending um, consultations with National Treasury and other stakeholders. Um, so could you speak to us about this and perhaps also the access to credit having been you know, a bigger issue? I mean, I, I guess this has been an issue from time immemorial for you know, any business, but is this something that then um, shows up uh, revenues for um, those uh, traders and manufacturers? Um, the issue of the CRB listing, I think uh, we, we say it's a, it's a welcome move by the president. What we need to continue to look at is why people are getting listed in the first place. Mm -hmm. What has led to businesses having to resort uh, to borrowing and also being unable to pay. I think it begs to a bigger question of access to affordable finance for small businesses within the country. I know that last year when the COVID measures were put in place, one of the major things was to see how we also... Uh, cushion businesses from the impact of COVID, and that was quite welcome, where we saw the reduction of pay as you earn, mm. the reduction of VAT, amongst other measures uh, come in place to support businesses as they weathered through the COVID storm. So I think it's also high time we looked at what are the other measures we need to put in place so that the cost of doing business comes down. How do we hold back on certain tax measures that are going to affect the cost of production and eventually lead to businesses being unable uh, to either access credit or even pay for the credit that they've already accessed in the market. So I think it's a broader conversation of how we bring down the cost of production, uh, how we deal with even the taxation space currently as we allow businesses to recover, what are some of the measures and stimulus we can put in place to stimulate the economy as we saw last year. Mm. And then the issue of uh, credit guarantee schemes, I know that that was a conversation and some have been put in place but how do we ensure that some of these schemes are able to capture the MSMEs? Because a lot of them would probably capture the small and medium businesses, but we still have the MSMEs left out of this. How do we get them to access affordable credit? A lot of the time it would have to come from government setting up uh, some of these schemes because commercially the banks will still be looking at the issues of risk, looking at the issues of collateral, the cash flows in the business, and the usual things that they have to look at. So I think government would still have to play a bigger role in ensuring that they provide affordable credit, especially for small businesses yeah. uh, and MSMEs, so that we then reduce the need for people to resort to uh, being listed to the CRBs. The other bigger issue, of course, has been the conversation of crowding out of the private sector, yes. out of borrowing. We are seeing the amount of money government is borrowing yeah, from the locally. domestic market. And this definitely means that if banks can lend to government, yeah. why would they lend to a riskier yeah, absolutely. MSME? Absolutely. So I think we also need to look broadly then at the issue of uh, government debt and ensuring that we don't crowd out the private sector from the domestic Okay. Uh, borrowing market. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And, and just uh, stay with me, Phyllis. I want to come back to you and, and Samuel, uh, who's with me in studio, to talk about what some of those additional measures are. You know, now we're starting to talk about building back better. What does that look like? I think uh, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed a number of issues that many businesses were facing, you know, in the beginning, made them worse, amplified them in some certain respects. So beyond a stimulus package, you know, in, in the short term, uh, what should we start to see in the medium and long term? So just uh, stay with me for just a moment as we take a look at what happens next. But let's take a look at what's happening in the um, hospitality sector, as both of my guests uh, here have alluded to. Um, what does this mean for them? And of course, it's not just things opening up here in Kenya, but opening up globally as well as, uh, you know, many, many countries continue to vaccinate more of their populations and also international travel starts to resume. What does this mean for the hospitality sector our Nikki Gitonga is in Kwale County which is um, the hotbed if you like for the tourism sector uh, he's speaking with some operators there Nikki what uh, do things look like uh, for the residents of Kwale and for the tourism operators there well uh, Yvonne uh, it's a sigh of relief to most of the stakeholders 
in the tourism industry in Kwale County. We are aware that uh, tourism is the uh, Kwale economic uh, block, and that's the reason why after op opening up of the economy by President Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, right now the tourism stakeholders are saying that uh, uh, during the Christmas holiday they expect uh, uh, domestic uh, tourists to flock uh, into the country, into the county, I mean. Uh, remember, there are about 6,000 uh, people who uh, were working in the tourism industry in Kwale. They were laid off uh, during the period of pandemic since 2019. About 10,000 people who also are working uh, in the nightclub, the eateries, were also laid off as a result of the pandemic. But with the government uh, lifting up the, the dust to don't curfew, uh, the tourism sector, the stakeholders, uh, they do have a lot of hope that their industry is going to get back into the field. Pengine, uh, kindly, I uh, right now I want to talk to the manager, uh, the general manager of Lopez Beach uh, Resort. Now that the lift has been, uh, I mean the curfew has been lifted up, what's, is there any hope to the industry? Oh uh, yes, uh, Nick, uh, there is hope, but um, given where we are coming from and how far deep we had sunk, uh, it cannot be an, an abracadabra thing, you know, we wake up and the hotels are full. And um, it's also important to mention that, um, it's, important, it's important to mention that, um, just, just, just hold on. Okay. it's important to mention that uh, while the domestic market has, is the one indeed that uh, kept us, you know, afloat when uh, the curfew and when pandemic took place uh, about two years ago, uh, but the infrastructure that we have in this country, and in Indiana for that matter, has to be supported by the international market. And um, it's good to see that uh, the charters are beginning uh, with Ukraine uh, being one of the premier ones. But uh, our, our um, you know, source markets like, uh, like uh, Germany, uh, they have still not started, you know, started traveling. So at least there's a ray of hope, but uh, more still needs to be done. And we'll need a bit of more time before we go back to where we used to be. But uh, it, it's a beautiful start. What do you recommend to the government so that uh, tourism is back on its feet? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, there's a lot has been said before, but uh, coming uh, one of the critical thing, uh, just the open sky, you know, uh, policy. If we could have uh, other, you know, carriers coming uh, internationally. We know that uh, we have a cardinal rule perhaps to, 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 to protect Kenya Airways. But at the same time, uh, there's also a need for us to open up competition so that uh, uh, it can ease the movement of uh, people internationally. Because without the international market, uh, still it will take us longer than it should uh, for us to be where we would want to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Let me speak to uh, the chairman of bar owners in Kwale County. We're aware that the businesses, especially those working in bars and nightclubs, were highly affected as a result of the curfew. Now, uh, curfew has been lifted up. What do you expect? For the last four days, we have done good business, mm -hmm. and we, ho we hope mm -hmm. we are not going to get any interference mm -hmm. from uh, some quarters of the government. Mm -hmm. But all in all, as at now, we are okay. Mm -hmm. And we are, uh, we are just um, hurting the government to bring, to make vaccination centers mm -hmm. to every bar. Mm -hmm. yeah, because we need everybody to be vaccinated. Yes. So that next time we don't have such a curfews again. Mm -hmm. And also we need at least to the, the government to do, to relax some taxes mm -hmm. from, uh, from us as businessmen. Okay. So yes. How are the taxes currently? Oh, they haven't started, but I know very soon they will start. So we are just urging them to give us like six six months holiday tax relief. Okay. Yes, then from there we'll do good business. Okay, thank you, thank you. You, are, you have heard from the two tourism, uh, tourism stakeholders uh, recommending that it will be better for the government at least to relax the taxes for at least six months so that... Uh, the industry gets back into its feet. And the other thing also, according to the one of the, uh, the chairman of bar owners is saying that uh, it would be better also for uh, the bars and nightclubs to be vaccination COVID centers so that those who go there to party after party, at least uh, they get vaccinated so that uh, those places do not become a uh, spreading zone for COVID-19, uh, Yvonne. 
That's right, and hoping for better tidings. I think everybody's hoping that the year will end much better than it started. Some proposals there that uh, we've heard from. I know Samuel Karanja wants to weigh in, but allow me to take a commercial break uh, here on Business Now. Thanks to Sami Kitonga and his two guests, uh, Nikki Kitonga and his two guests. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll get our final thoughts from Samuel Karanja and from Phyllis Wakiaga on where we go from here. Do we need to do more? Were the president's interventions a little shy of taking us uh, you know, over the brink to the next level. We'll be discussing that and more when we come back. Also, remember, Made in Kenya is back this week again, and uh, we'll be telling you who we'll have in just a moment. And we're back talking about um, the uh, reopening of uh, the economy, businesses, and the lifting of the curfew and the effect that that'll have on the SME sector. Um, let me um, give you Samuel Karanja, uh, still with me, the CEO of the SME Alliance. And we also have Phyllis Wakiaga, who's the CEO of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Samuel, you've been waiting in the wings to just add on to quite a bit of what has been said. Yeah. Uh, some saying that perhaps more should have been done. We've mm -hmm. heard from um, those who are speaking with Nikki Kitonga in Kuala that, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps tax relief measures. Mm -hmm. Be that as it may, I want your final thoughts on, um, you know, where we go from here, some of the mm -hmm. lessons that COVID has taught us mm -hmm. um, that, you know, now we're saying we're building back better and yes. perhaps we can also have the opportunity to say never mm -hmm. again, this is what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. This is the direction in which we should be going that helps the MSME sector grow and thrive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I, I think we have seen a lot of emphasis with small medium entrepreneurs, uh, both political arena and also in the business arena. And I think it has come to a realize the government has come to a realization the impact and the contribution of SMEs in the economy and I think that's key so that now from there the policies which now the government makes towards that sector are informed policies because initially we had very puni punitive policies and uh, the other thing that uh, we didn't have is a voice and that's why we came together as SME so that we can voice our you know concerns to the government the other thing that the government I think um, should do is in, um, in what the president has done, why don't we have like the, 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 the stimulus package that he had last, uh, you know, last year? Uh, we had um, credit guarantees, and, and I think the credit guarantees is a brilliant idea, mm -hmm. whereby the government steps in so that um, they give But the uptake of that, Samuel, has been for five billion that they promised, we discussed this on the show last week, it's about mm. 150 million thereabouts yes. that's been offered uh, to, to SME sector, mm. Uh, mm. you know, through the banks. Mm. So there seems to be, you know, quite a bit Everyone is mm. saying they're offering money for the SME mm. sector, mm. but mm. how much of that is actually... Getting there. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's a procedure that they use. Uh, they should simplify. And, and you know, if, for example, we subject this money to to the bank, as Phyllis is saying, mm. it's going to be subjected to, you know, to finance policies, which mm. the central bank uh, really controls. And I think we should have other avenues like microfinances. And you have also seen an influx of a registration of circles, whereby people come together with a vision of resuscitating and sustaining in their businesses. We have Buddha Buddha Sako, we have Matatu Sako, we have Marikiti Mamamboga Sako, mm -hmm. you know, coming together to see that they are able to have maybe a merry-go-round or a table banking approach towards resuscitating, resuscitating their businesses. But one of the things which I re really affects us is the tax policies. We usually have um, very punitive tax policies and I think the government should go slow on that. And um, I know the tax policies is really dear to the government because also of the government expenditure. And so the government expenditure should be directly proportional to the money that we are collecting. And I think we should lower the government expenditure because the, 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 you know, the, the force that comes to with that, it makes now the government push us more mm. and push us more the drain. So uh, in the drain, so you find that whatever the government is saying, it can be double standards if, for example, they don't put some things to, uh, you know, uh, into consideration. Uh, lastly, but not least, I think uh, affordable financing is key also, whereby we are able to get money at a lower rate. Um, we are getting financial institutions which the government partners with, you know, government schemes to partner and see how they can be able to do that. And I remember there's a time um, the Ministry of Trade and Industrialization were giving money and I was a beneficiary, I think it was 2003, 2004, mm -hmm. where you are, you are taken for training and you get some money to start your business and you even give your business plan. Yeah. Here, I think government has mechanisms and programs and infrastructure to which they can be able to dispense that money to small medium entrepreneurs and that is key and uh, lastly but not least i think the cost of production we have seen now that 
you know, a good number of our members, are, and I think we had a conversation with you last time mm -hmm. on Consolidated Cargo. Mm -hmm. Now, as much as we do a lot of imports, yeah. why can't we now come to you? Because obviously we, we, we have to grow our economy through production. Yes. Why don't you now put a lot of energy in production, as you see the president has done? Mm -hmm. Agribusiness, opening, you know, regional markets, right. you know, not only regional, but also international market. The other day I saw the president signing with KEPSA an agreement between the United, uh, the, the, yeah. the U.S. traders and, and the Kenya traders. Yes. Expose us even quality control yeah. of products so that our products here can match and the can standards. compete yes. with, with, the, with those standards. And I think that's key when it comes to SMEs. SMEs is a huge force because... Uh, 70, actually not 80 percent of all the businesses in Kenya yeah. are SME. Some people say it's 98. Right. So when you look at that, the focus should be ideally to see how we can be able to resuscitate and maintain that thrust of small and medium entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And that number of uh, the MSME sector is not just in Kenya, it's worldwide. Yes, it is. Um, still being the biggest employer um, around the world and not just in Kenya. Phyllis, your closing thoughts? Um, my thoughts are that during COVID, one of the things we noted is that the supply chain shocks require us to have a very strong manufacturing sector. And last year, we did see the sector show up and manufacture products that were not previously uh, made in the country. So I think as we move forward, uh, as a country, we need to reflect on the need to nurture some of these nascent opportunities that emerged during COVID and see how we work to support the local manufacturing sector because it was quite clear last year that if you don't have a strong manufacturing sector, you can actually go without uh, a lot of products and goods within the country. What we are doing as come for this is this year, uh, from November 24th to 28th, we'll be at Kasarani for the Changamka Kenya Shopping Festival, where we'll be celebrating the resilience of the local manufacturing sector, having super sales at factory prices, showcasing new products that have been launched during this period of time, and really just celebrating the resilience we saw. We'll also be in Mombasa from 1st to 5th December. So I think this is really a conversation to take forward on how do we continue to support these opportunities that are emerging in manufacturing, both for small manufacturers, for medium and large manufacturers, who have demonstrated a lot of resilience uh, during the pandemic. And lastly, for me, as we move forward, even if we've reopened the economy, we can't forget the fact that the economy of the country follows the health of the people, so we really want to urge that we vaccinate as many people as possible for those who haven't been vaccinated to take advantage of the vaccines that are already in the country and that we still observe the measures like wearing masks when we're within closed rooms and other measures that really will help us uh, minimize the spread of the COVID vaccine so that we can get into full normalcy as soon as possible. And lastly, just to agree with my colleague Samuel, that government looks at the tax measures and uh, looks at moving to some of the measures we had last year and also cutting on the expenditure. As the supplementary budgets go through, can we look at expenditure? Because the big push that is driving the tax authorities and national treasury to come up with many taxes is really because of the government expenditure. So if we can really look at this, I think it will give business room to be able to recover from this pandemic. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you, Phyllis Wakiaga, the CEO of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Many thanks to you for your time. And thank you as well, Samuel Karanja, the CEO of the SME Alliance, for always making time for us here on the program. But we're done with that bit of the discussion, but it's time for our regular Made in Kenya series. Now, an idea that originated among friends in 2017 is today a flourishing business. Va Kenya started when the co-founders visited a cobbler in Nairobi's Karyoko market simply because one of them had big feet. Edward Chua tells us the story. In Nairobi's Donom area, a group of youth is immersed in computers and smartphones in a rented two-room upstairs. This group is busy designing and making sales online under the watchful eye of their leader. Njerim Bote is the co-founder of VAR Kenya, a company that specializes in shoe making and retailing. We make shoes for Africans. Now, Africa is a very unique uh, place. You know, we have a unique climate. You know, we have uh, unique bodies. Our feet are different from other people. We walk a lot. 
and our feet are a bit wider. Back in, I started back in 2017. So right af after campus, I had a friend who introduced me to uh, shoemaking. My co-founder, she's called Daisy Rono. She's a Bigfoot client. A few months in, we started getting so many requests from our clients to customize for their sizes, for their shapes, and that opened our eyes to the big gap that we actually have in the market. Va Kenya makes all types of shoes for school, official and casual wear. In all these, they use both leather and fabric as raw materials, all sourced locally. On our market, we sell everything uh, online. We actually don't have physical locations. We have this simple measurement kit. It's on our website. We basically just take your measurements, you know, from, uh, from your, your longest toe to your heel. Then from the widest part of your toe, that's across the ball of the foot. Then you take the circumference of the ball of the foot and the circumference of the wrist of the foot. For the leather, we purchase from our local tanneries. Then for the fabrics, we mostly buy most of them from Kikomba. Jerry says together with our co-founder, they did everything by themselves when they started for a whole year. But today, she has a team and offers internship and training to those keen on learning the craft. Yeah, we've been growing uh, within the time period and right now we have six permanent employees. We also have a sales team and we have partnered with other manufacturers in the informal sector. So we started an apprenticeship program where we were taking uh, apprentices who know nothing about shoemaking. They graduated uh, last, last August. Uh, we took 10 students and uh, we trained them for six months. Then for the other six months, we attached them in various workshops, you know, for the, for the, for the, for the experience and all that. Jerry says it was an uphill task initially to convince customers to accept their designs. You can't really blame Kenyans for thinking that uh, made in Kenya is low quality because we have not actually been exposed to quality made in Kenya products. Most Kenyan manufacturers, you know, once your product is good, the reflex, you know, or the next thing they do is export. We really, really had a problem, you know, attracting and retaining talent. First, they are very few. And uh, the ones that we have, we cannot say that they are fully, fully skilled to the, to the, to the point that should be for us to make quality footwear. On a typical bad day in Bahia, we can make even as little as five pairs. In terms of sales, we can sell also as little as five pairs. Edward Chwea, Business Now, Citizen TV. Okay, so that's it for our show this afternoon. Remember, if you want to be featured on the Made in Kenya segment, send us a tweet at Citizen TV Kenya, at Yvonne Okwara. Please use the hashtag Made in Kenya. And we will be happy to feature your business uh, as we do here, celebrating the MSME sector. Thanks for watching the show. We will see you again next week. God bless you. Bye-bye. Across the country are belting up, innovating and diversifying to sustain their businesses. We have our own fundies who come in with the papyrus streets together. They are inspiring other entrepreneurs and growing the economy. Our products mainly include uh, delivered boxes for motorbikes. Our products can be used with nails. The manufacture of custom roofing solution. Every Monday we celebrate them and tell their story their experiences, challenges, and their triumphs. Made in Kenya, every Monday on Business Now.